So normally we talk about duels with things like this, but today we're going to be looking at five amazing facts that I have learned about duels with this. Hi folks, Matt Easton here. Now normally I talk about swords, dueling, battles, war, everything to do with swords, the design of them, the use of them, and the modern art of fencing as well. But for those of you who watch my channel avidly, you'll know that I'm also a shooter. I shoot uh, historic firearms as well as modern firearms as well. And here in the UK, I'm a member of the Muzzle Loaders Association of Great Britain and also the NRA of Great Britain. So I shoot everything from old muzzle loaders, muskets and uh, revolvers, uh, single shot pistols, all the way up to modern shotguns and even 2-2 semi-automatics. Now I have been sent an amazing new book which has only recently just come out called The Pursuit of Honour, a history of the pistol duel in Britain and France. And it does also pertain to the wider world apart from that as well. But Britain and France have two contrasting cultures as far as pistol dueling is concerned and were famous exponents of the duel. And in many ways, um, their practices were emulated around the world. So uh, in reading this book, and there is a link to this down below, it is a seminal work. We'll look inside the book in a second. Uh, but but in looking in this book, I have found five amazing facts, which I didn't know or almost didn't know or didn't fully understand uh, from that book. So I thought I'd share them with you. So five amazing facts that I've learned from that book about pistol dueling. So one of the first things I've learned, which I vaguely knew, I think, but this has really hammered it home for me, is that actually pistols used for dueling was a really English thing in the sense that, not that pe other people outside of England uh, and Britain didn't use pistols for dueling, but rather in Britain, it became quite early on, uh, it fell out of favor using swords for dueling and pistols came in. So really, really quite early on. And the earliest um, occurrences of, of this are actually back in the 1600s. But already in the early 1700s, pistols were starting to take over from swords, particularly the small sword, like this Kulishmard example here, which is English and silver hilted dating to uh, 1723. Um, and quite early on, the English abandoned the sword, not completely, but mostly, and switched to pistols for dueling. But in contrast, the French, more or less, mostly stuck with the sword, uh, which I not really appreciated, but it actually makes sense of an awful lot of things, primarily the fact that fencing was seen as a French thing and why particularly foil fencing and therefore small sword fencing was so highly developed in France. And in the 19th century, the premier teachers and masters for the use of the small sword in the world were the French because they kept a very strong tradition of sword dueling all the way through to the 20th century. Whereas the English or the British as a whole had more or less switched to pistols most of the time. Another interesting detail, I am actually holding here a French pistol, ironically, um, but these were usually or very often used in pistol duels in France. They were very often holster pistols or essentially officers pistols. So whereas we had very specialized culture of dueling pistol manufacturer and use in the British Isles, in France, very often pistol duels were carried out with the same pistol that an officer would take to war. The second most amazing fact that I've learned is that you get these beautiful cased sets and there's some wonderful examples shown in here of paired pistols like those shown just up here. And so it's a boxed set containing everything you need to load, fire, clean and maintain your pair of pistols and they are made as a pair, presented as a pair and kept as a pair. And I had always assumed that that pair was for one person to use and the other person to use the other one. So they were a matched pair. And I found out that that actually isn't correct. They were a pair of pistols because very often, well not necessarily very often, but sometimes a pair of pistols were both used in the duel. And this was something I wasn't really aware of. I thought that duelists using pistols, one person had one pistol, the other person had the other pistol. It turns out that sometimes each person had a pair of pistols. And in some cases they would fire one pistol and then be allowed to take their turn and fire the second one as well. So in other words, getting a second bite at the cherry. Now, in fact, this wonderful book, The Pursuit of Honor, has countless um, examples of duels. It's got very, very detailed um, accounts of deals and a huge number of pictures of 
uh, pistols of cased sets like I was just referring to. And uh, this is um, written by uh, Dr. Louis Bremers, um, who is essentially a massive collector and researcher into pistols, dueling pistols and pistol dueling. So not only is there a huge number of pistols shown, but there is a huge number of accounts and descriptive accounts both of actual duels that happened, but also all of the culture around dueling and the debates that happened around dueling, dueling texts and the legalities of it as well. So it's not just about the guns, of which there's beautiful examples of all the different types of uh, firearms used for dueling, uh, and for later for sporting purposes as well throughout this book, absolutely top-notch beautiful photos. Um, but there's also, if I just flick to it um, earlier part of the uh, book, there we go. There's also examples of um, actual duels that happened and how they went down. And what's interesting as well is how, although there were codes for dueling and there were rules, a lot of the way that they were actually carried out differed from each other. So the distances varied. Um, usually, um, I think it was about uh, 10 to 15 paces or yards, um, but the distances varied and also the order of play, as it were, the way that things would actually be carried out um, differed a lot from duel to duel and different circumstances. So it's actually absolutely cra crammed full of uh, beautiful artwork and descriptive accounts, as well as amazing photos of the actual pistols themselves. Now, number three of the amazing facts I've learned from this book so far, and it's a big book, so I certainly haven't read all of it so far, um, but that is that pistol sellers, so um, purveyors of good quality pistols, a lot of them actually had gallery ranges, indoor ranges, in their shops and you could go in and you could try out the pistols and um, you know they could basically show you how a more expensive pistol was was uh, worth the extra money and would have a better quality lock and was maybe more accurate and this kind of stuff um, and so these shops actually had indoor gallery ranges and they became so popular that at a certain point people would actually meet up at these as a regular social event and go for a spot of shooting and then maybe go for coffee or a, a glass of port afterwards. Sounds absolutely fantastic. I wish I could still do that in the local, local shopping street. So one of the other amazing things I found out from this book was that dueling pistols were in some ways similar to Formula One in relation to modern street cars in that they were a test bed for new technology. And the percussion cap is a great example of that. So what I have here is a percussion lock pistol. Um, that is, we cock there, take the protective cap off there. The percussion cap goes on the end there. So there's no flint. This is not a flint, flint lock. Um, however, flint locks preceded this. And in fact, they, the early adopters of the percussion lock in many ways were dueling pistols. And they went quite quickly over to percussion lock, whereas the military were quite conservative. And it wasn't until about, I think, 1838 that the British Army actually officially switched from, um, from flint lock to percussion lock for the standard issue musket. So in many ways, the design of locks and the, the exact details of the mechanism and even the, the fundamental firing mechanism as well and the types of percussion cap um, used were in many ways tested on these sorts of firearms before they became standard military technology later on. So the fifth amazing fact I've learned from this uh, really, really cool book linked below is that the barrels to paired pistols were often forged in a pair. This completely blew my mind. So they were often forged out uh, with the muzzles attached. So usually the breech is uh, thicker and wider, or very often it's thicker and wider than the uh, muzzle. And the muzzle of the other one be would be coming out here. And they would essentially forge out the whole thing, so widening at each end, like a, almost like a dumbbell, and then uh, bore the thing all the way through. So it had a standard bore from one breech all the way through both muzzles through to the other breech. So one long bar now uh, bored out through the center. So it exactly matches. And only at that point would they be cut off. So you knew you had an exactly matched and symmetrical pair of barrels. How cool is that? So you know what, as this has been a fairly brief video, I'm gonna give you a sixth bonus fact that I've learned from this um, really awesome book. And that is 
that um, quality makers like Manton, for example, and Manton are a primer example of this, um, one of the things that they did later on is they started building quite heavy, heavy muzzled, heavy ended pistols, much like this example I've got here, which is a French military um, example, with an octa usually an octagonal barrel, specifically with a heavy nose, so that there was a tendency when people fired as a result of various things of um, raising. So this is true of muskets and rifles as well. There was a tendency amongst soldiers, but there's also a tendency amongst duelists of when they fired to fire high. Now, for this reason, some people were taught to fire low to actually, and this is true with revolvers as well, to actually aim low on the target. Because if you hit someone in the gut, you've hit them. If you then raise up as a result of the uh, kind of recoil essentially. Um, if you raise up from the gut level and you hit them in the chest, that's still fine. If you hit them in the head, that's still fine. But if you aim at their chest and raise up, you might go completely clean over their head. So for this reason, it's better to aim low and hit them somewhere than aim high and hit them nowhere. Um, but one of the beauties of having a heavy um, sort of front forward weighted and balanced pistol is that it tends to keep your nose down and also it tends to counter effect somewhat the raise of the recoil when you fire the pistol. Um, and so for accuracy purposes, and a lot of these were smoothbore, this is smoothbore, um, for accuracy purposes, just to make sure you got the bullet somewhere on the target, they were specifically weighted in a way that's quite front heavy. So there we go, five facts that I've learned from this awesome book, and in fact, a sixth bonus one. Um, as I say, it's got absolutely tons and tons and tons of information in it. Um, one, because I like to give some constructive feedback, one minor criticism is it does touch on the pre-pistol duel, it touches on the sword duel, and I think that's the weakest bit of the book and probably should have been left out, actually. Um, but to research it more and add in more detail would have made the book obviously much bigger and fundamentally this is a book about pistol dueling. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the laws, the regulations, the culture, the culture of honour, um, uh, and, uh, so, and the actual accounts of the actual duels themselves, and the actual pistols and how they developed the technology and where it went to, it became sporting in the end. If you know about the early history of the Olympics, you'll know they experimented with wax bullets and some fun formats for shooting each other in a safe way that didn't result in death. You can read about that in the book. Anyway, so The Pursuit of Honor by Dr. Louis Bremis. Um, I will stick the link down below. Awesome book, it's not cheap, I warn you that, but um, these sorts of books are, tend to be limited print run and once this is out of uh, print, at some point in the future, I suspect that the value of this will go up and up. And there aren't a huge number of books about pistol dueling or pistols, pistols for dueling, dueling pistols. Um, so this is, if you're interested in that subject or you're interested in the history of firearms, this is super, super important. And a final thought as well is that a lot of people uh, criticize my love of the sword from a military perspective because in fact historically swords are not hugely important military weapons. Things like bows and spears earlier on and then later on firearms are militarily more important. Uh, but we could say all the same things of pistols. Militarily pistols aren't very important in the modern world and never really have been but they're the, in many ways, the equivalent of the sword. And much like on the battlefield, they're a sidearm and a backup weapon most of the time that it's nice to have if you need it, but doesn't actually get used an awful lot. Actually, these were used an awful lot for dueling. And that often gets overlooked because we fixate on warfare. So actually looking at the history of dueling, obviously on this channel, we look at sword dueling, but looking at the history of pistol dueling as well, very, very important. If you're interested in pistols, you should at least know about, have a working knowledge about dueling pistols and the history of pistol dueling. Anyway, check out that link below. Um, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you've learned something new in this video. If you did learn something new, tell me which new thing it was down in the comments. I'm interested to know. Maybe all the things were new to you. Maybe none of them were new to you. If you've got some interesting facts to share about pistol dueling that I didn't talk about in this video today, then teach me something, teach us all something, get posting in the comments down below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope we see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks.